Hey guys, welcome to the Remnant Radio. Today we're talking about miracles with Dr. Craig Keener at Asbury Seminary. Stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey guys, welcome back. We are so excited. We're not in our normal studio this week. Uh, we're actually up in Kentucky. Yeah, they, they let yeah, me out of the basement we today. We let you out of the basement, <laughs> Michael. It's so good. You're actually a real person. You're not just an avatar. It's yeah, so, yeah. so good to Who see knew? you. Who knew? So, and Dr. Keener, one of our favorite uh, uh, guests. And so we are going to be uh, meeting with him or meeting with him, conver- uh, conversing with him about all things miracles. Before we do that, uh, just... I uh, want to invite you guys, if you've benefited from what Remnant Radio is doing, just check out the links in the description. You can donate on PayPal, a one-time, uh, a one-time gift, or you can also donate in Patreon, where we come out with exclusive content. And uh, So please consider supporting our channel. This uh, trip to Asbury Seminary wasn't free. We're actually filming uh, over 16 chapters of Mark. It's just a service to the body of Christ, and Dr. Keener's working on a commentary on the book of Mark, and so we're talking about that, but we're taking a little break to just talk miracles today. So uh, anyway, hit that subscribe button. Lots of great stuff coming down the pike, and uh, Michael and I are going to be uh, talking uh, talking specifically about this uh, the book that, uh, that you wrote, Dr. Keener, on miracles, a two-volume set documenting miracles. So uh, we're going to begin the episode talking a little bit about just kind of uh, just theory and philosophy of miracles. We're going to try to uh, just begin this on a just intellectual note here, but then we're going to spend a lot of time talking through documented cases of miracles across the board, nature miracles, resurrection miracles, blind, deaf, congenital things. We're going to talk all the things. So really exciting episode today. Uh, Michael, did I miss anything? No, I'm excited about this. So I I first got my hands on your two volume work. I guess that was, I don't know, 2016, 2015. And then I came down to to Dallas or at Fort Worth when you did your colloquy and taught through this stuff. And so to get to do this is a huge privilege for me. I'm kind of geeking out, getting yeah. to have this conversation in person. So and, and, and I'm I'm actually physically present, not in yes. the basement. Yes. <laughs> I'm not photoshopped in. <laughs> That's good. Well, we're so excited. And and Dr. Keener has asked us to call him Craig. So um so, Craig, such a privilege to have you on the show. Uh, for those uh, for those who might not be familiar with, with who you are and what you do, obviously we're at Asbury Seminary, so we know that you teach here. Uh, and But maybe just tell us just a little bit about yourself. I'm Medine Keener's husband. I'm the father of David and Karen Keener. And <clears throat> I was converted from atheism some decades ago. I did my PhD in New Testament at Duke University. And I, I'm a New Testament professor. Okay. And, and I write, I've, I've written like maybe 30 books, well, 30, 33 books. Okay. And working on some more. <laughs> yeah, this, and you're working on a third volume a time. on miracles as well. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not part of the set. It's, okay. a, it's, a, new, it's a new book. Um, it is mostly new material, but it's shorter. So instead of being 1,100 pages and... <laughs> Most people will talk about it more than they'll actually read it and see what it actually says. Um, although you said you actually read it. The I did, through. yeah. Um, this this one's like 300 pages, so it'll be a lot more uh, accessible. It's, like a, it's a pamphlet. And a lot cheaper. <laughs> 33 <laughs> books is, is even more impressive when some of those books are over 1,000 pages. <laughs> so, uh, Well, yeah, dive right in. Let's, let's start yeah. with uh, the beginning of, of Miracles. You talk about David Hume and some of his arguments sort of sort of carte blanche dismissing the miraculous works. You want to start there? Yeah. David Hume's essay wasn't as influential in his own generation as it came to be later because Hume was so widely respected for some of his other work. And, and he's writing in what century? The He's writing in the 1700s. 1700s. And actually some people, uh, <laughs> some of the refutations of Hume that came out in his own generation were pretty successful in terms of you know, the persuasive appeal. I mean, the, the person who came up with the 
um, the probability theory that, that stands behind modern statistics actually first deployed that, that theory in refutation of Hume's argument on miracles. Oh, wow. uh, so it's been, it's been challenged for a long time, but in recent years, it's really been challenged a lot. Um, publications, book, books by uh, Cambridge, uh, I think Cornell, uh, Oxford. Actually, the one by, by Oxford was called Hume's Abject Failure, His Argument About Miracles. Wow. And somebody, so Abject Failure is in the title of the it's book? It's in the title of the book. And then <laughs> somebody responded, uh, reviewed that and said, well, you just don't like his argument because you're a Christian. And the author said, no, I'm actually not a Christian in any traditional sense. I just thought it was a bad argument and needed to be responded to from a philosophic perspective. So uh, it wasn't one of Hume's strongest arguments. Okay. Of course, it's easy to critique him now that he's dead. That's posthumous <laughs> critique. Ah, oh, well played. That's <laughs> why we love you. Hume or. <laughs> You've made those before. This was yeah, on I, the I spot. There's no before. way. <laughs> well, okay. So quickly, just if you can summarize it, the argument that Hume made and why it's why it's failed. Yeah, it's it's in two parts. The first part is that miracles are violations of natural law. Natural law can't be violated and therefore miracles can't happen, which is entirely, it's a play on words, like what I just did with Hume's name. Um, it, it's based on a conception of natural law that is no longer our conception of natural law. And it also doesn't work with the conceptions of natural law in its day. I mean, he was, he was using the work of Newton and the Newtonians, but Newton and the early Newtonians didn't believe that God was subject to natural law. They believed that he structured the universe according to natural law, but that God was free to do miracles because he was, he was above nature and, and not subject to rules that he himself designed. So, uh, so I mean, to hold so, the, the creator by creaturely laws doesn't make any sense. It, it sounds like he basically baked into his, his definition yeah. the fact that he was right. <laughs> yeah, which is not, it's not the way Hume himself usually argues. But let's say I drop this pen. If I catch the pen, I'm not violating the law of gravity. I'm simply working within nature. What kind of God would be impotent compared to me? I mean, what kind of God couldn't work within nature if I could? I mean, you have to start with either atheistic or completely deistic premises, which is basically what Hume does, but doesn't give his audience the courtesy of explaining that, that my argument only works if you're a deist or an atheist to begin with. And then the second part of his argument, which I think is kind of the basis for his first, but there are different, different interpretations of this. Why, why should we trust any miracle claims? You never have any adequately trustworthy witnesses for them. And then he goes on to dismiss all sorts of categories of people. Well, if they're not educated, they don't count. Uh, they have to be respectable people who have something to lose. And you can't, you can't count anything that's not from the Western world. Uh, he, was, he was very racist wow. in, in that. I mean, everybody today would recognize that some of his stuff was, was racist. Uh, it's more explicit in some of his other writings, but that's right there in his argument about miracles. Um, there are a bunch of other subsidiary claims, but just summarizing. So, I mean, I think today we would know better than to say, you know, you have to exclude all. I mean, he actually says elsewhere in his writings that no civilization has ever produced any great works of art or science or anything except white civilizations. Ah. So dismissing ancient Chinese civilization dismissing African empires, dismissing, you know, and, and treating some other civilizations like Egypt and so on as if they were completely white. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, very it's, biased. It sounds like he's saying uh, on some level, he's a priori, uh, like already writing off anybody who would discount his argument again and saying that anybody, no uh, thinking human would believe in miracles. Therefore, miracles just don't happen today. Yeah. And you have no credible witnesses so what happens if you do have credible witnesses? Well, then Hume goes back to saying, well, they can't really be credible, right? Because they because believe in he, miracles. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one, of his, uh, one of his things, well, okay, what happens if it's somebody from the West, if you've got educated people saying this? So the example of Blaise Pascal's niece, 
Uh, she had a running eyesore, emitted a foul odor. It was clearly organic. And she was touched with a holy thorn from Jesus' crown of thorns at a Jansenist monastery. Now, I don't believe it was really a thorn from Jesus' holy crown of thorns. I think Luther was probably right. There were enough, um, enough nails from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony. Mm -hmm. uh, just, there were a lot of relics, <laughs> sure, fake sure. relics floating around. But, but it was a contact point for her faith. She was instantly and publicly healed in the sight of many witnesses. The Queen Mother of France sent her own physician who confirmed the miracle. But Hume, how does Hume deal with that? He says, well, this is medically documented. This is witnesses we would consider credible. But we know this didn't happen. So and they were even we, white. Yeah, they yeah, were... they were even white. <laughs> we, we know this didn't happen. So why would we believe anything else? And then he moves on. That's his argument. And he could get away with that because nobody liked Jansenists. Uh, there were two Augustinian for French Jesuits at the time, and they were too Catholic for uh, the Protestant audience in the in British Isles. And so Hume got away with that argument, but I don't think Hume would make that argument today. I mean, that there are no credible witnesses. Because like there's this 2006 Pew Forum survey of Pentecostals and Charismatics in just 10 countries. And in that survey, among well, Pentecostals and Protestant Charismatics in those 10 countries, you have somewhere around 200 million people who claim to have witnessed divine healing. And if you don't like Pentecostals or Protestant Charismatics, well, you've got the control group, which was other Christians, those who don't claim to be Pentecostals or Protestant Charismatics, 39% of them in those 10 countries claim to have witnessed divine healing. So, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. Now, nobody would say that all of those are actually explicable only as miracles. Probably nobody would say that all of those are, are miracles, but, uh, but you can't start with the a priori premise right. that there's no credible witnesses, that uniform human experience is against miracles when you've got hundreds of thousands, of, well, hundreds of millions well, of people. Yeah. And, and China wasn't included in that survey. And it's really hard to get uh, statistics, religious statistics in China, but there was a source within the China Christian Council affiliated with the Three Self Church, which is like the more government approved uh, body around the year 2000. They said that roughly half of all conversions in the previous couple decades had been due to faith healing experiences. And the house church estimates are often even higher than that. So. I mean, these are people who didn't start with Christian premises. And to some extent, many of them were abandoning centuries of other traditions, people who already had indigenous religious healing traditions uh, in China and in a number of other countries. I mean, Bal Krishna Sharma, Dr. Bal Krishna Sharma from Nepal told me that 80% of converts to Christian faith in Nepal are due to healings and deliverances. And so, I mean, we're talking about millions of people, not starting with Christian premises, who became Christians, often at great social cost to themselves, because they were persuaded by something, some sort of miracle, some sort of healing that was more dramatic than, you know, just whatever mm -hmm. they normally experienced. Wow. So, uh, so you shared some statistics that are pretty overwhelming because I mean, 200 million, even if it's 1%, 2 million people, right? Like if only 1% was accurate mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it, it, most would say probably more than 1% of people are not lying. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I know your book was largely focused on documented cases and that's so hard to find could you share with us, uh, how would you like to go about this? We can go by classifying miracles into resurrection miracles, uh, people who had congenital issues, people who had you know, deafness, blindness. We can go like that. Uh, we could just throw it over to you willy-nilly. You just start telling us miracle stories. But we, we'd love to just begin to tackle some of these stories. I think that the overarching question in that book, it would be, is there a case to be made for miracles happening today? And so, uh, and, and you can't dismiss it as being merely anecdotal when you look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so, so how would you make that argument? What's the best way to go about it? 
I, I do I do want to first say something about what you said about documented because uh, part of it depends on what you mean by documentation. So in some cases we have medical documentation. In a number of cases we have doctors' reports uh, of these things. Th then there are some cases where what we have are eyewitness testimony. Now eyewitness testimony is a form of evidence in journalism. I mean, some, there's some settings where we couldn't do without it. Journalism, law, um, historiography, where I work, but also sociology, anthropology, and so on. You, you, have, to, you have to work with that. And, and normally, when you're dealing with eyewitnesses, I mean, if you have a traffic accident and, and witnesses are being interviewed and somebody says, that's not what happened. I know that's not what happened because I didn't see it because I wasn't there. You know, we wouldn't take that seriously. But <laughs> with miracles, that's how people often think because I wasn't there. So um, there are different levels of documentation. But whenever I can get multiple independent witnesses or if it's somebody whose credibility I have really good reason to trust and they meet all of Hume's criteria, um, I have a number of cases where the eyewitnesses they have PhDs. They are, um, I mean, th these, are, these are people who are witnesses for food multiplying, for storm stilling, for- um, Rational people. Yeah, people being raised from the dead. Uh, just uh, instant disappearance of goiters and lumps and things like that. Um, but also we have cases with medical documentation and um, doctors I've interviewed and wow. Um, and you, you've also been an eyewitness yourself to uh, yeah. some miracles. Yeah. Not, I mean, not, I haven't seen somebody raised from the dead. I have seen a storm stilled uh, right after prayer. I have seen, I, yeah, I've seen some things, but not, we, 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 I haven't we seen We need to hear all. that story. Though. Uh, <laughs> I'll just pause there. Yeah, go uh, there. Tell me go. about the storm stilling. Oh, well, all right. Well, yeah, we were. I was teaching at an HBCU, or actually, I was teaching at the seminary attached to it, and we were going to have an outreach on the on the college campus that day, and then um, some students from another HBCU were were coming to join us for the outreach, <clears throat> but you know, we couldn't plan ahead for a storm. It was pouring down rain. It was supposed to be pouring down rain all day long, and. Well, we were going to try to do our best to do outreach in the rain, but there weren't going to be too many people outside. But then one of the one of the visiting students, a sophomore biology major from the other college, she said, well, let's just pray and see what God will do. Well, it couldn't hurt. So we all joined hands and prayed. She led us in prayer. She finished the prayer. The rain stopped. And a few minutes later, the sun came out. And it didn't rain again the rest of the day. So that's, you know, people say, well, that's a coincidence, but I've got a whole bunch of those from a bunch of different eyewitnesses. Um, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Okay. D well, okay. So if you're going to make the case for different kinds of documentation and, and this criteria being the way that you look at it, um, you know, eyewitness accounts by multiple people that are credible witnesses, uh, what would you say, give us one of those resuscitations from the dead? Oh, can I give you two? Sure. I'll give you two from doctors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Chauncey Crandall, cardiologist in West Palm Beach, was uh, making his rounds in the hospital. I think this was a Saturday when he was called to the, uh, I think, the ER. Somebody had collapsed with chest pains, and he'd been flatlined for about 40 minutes. So they had been trying to revive him, done everything they could. Nothing worked. Dr. Crandall had to make the cardiologist's decision to sign the death certificate. They followed all the American Heart Association protocols, so nothing more could be done. So he he was going. He signed the death certificate. Was going back to his rounds when he felt the Holy Spirit prompt him to go back and pray for the man to have a second chance to know the Lord, which obviously isn't you know what usually happens. But so he went back and. Uh, and that well, could cost him his job. I mean, something like that. <laughs> well, it could. I suppose uh, he, one of his colleagues came back in with him, and the nurse was sponging down the, the body to get ready for the, for the morgue. And yet some of the stuff was still hooked up, um, but still 
flatlined. So Dr. Crandall laid a hand on the man's head and said, God, I pray you'll give this man a second chance to know you. Wow. And he tells me the nurse was glaring at him like, Dr. Crandall, you have lost your mind. Mm. And he turned to his colleagues, said, shock him with a paddle one more time. You know, and being a doctor, you ought to you know, use every means at your disposal. That's the ethical thing to do. So his colleague is like, you know, we all agreed, but look, if you want, I guess there's no harm. Shocks him immediately, the heartbeat is normal. Which, you know, after after a couple minutes, you don't normally get a, a normal heartbeat <laughs> after one one defibrillator shock. And the nurse starts screaming, Dr. Crandall, what have you done? <laughs> because, you know, six minutes with no oxygen, irreparable brain damage has started in. His systems had shut down. The man was not just dead. He was very obviously dead. He was a white man, but his extremities had turned black from cyanosis. So they're assuming, you know, he's going to have irreparable brain damage and everything. But a couple of days later, Dr. Crandall's making his rounds, visits Jeff Markin, the auto mechanic who had this heart attack in the hospital. And the guy has no brain damage. And he does come to know the Lord. And uh, Dr. Wow. Crandall sends me a, a picture of him participating in Jeff Markin's baptism. Oh, and uh, uh, and wow. uh, they, they go around and share their testimony together now. And another account from a doctor is from Sean George. Sean George um, has all the medical records. Sometimes it's hard for people to get the medical records. They don't know how to get it. Uh, I think it may be easier to get them now, at least for the person. It's really hard for somebody other than the person to get them. But anyway, Sean George has all the defibrillator logs and everything. He went into cardiac arrest, and he was um, he was considered dead for like an hour and 50 minutes when his wife, Sherry Jacob, got there. And she, uh, you know, they said, just say your goodbyes to him. And, and she, instead, she, she cried. She's also a physician. She cried out for, for God to heal him. And suddenly, the heart monitor sprang to life. And they all, his doctors, his colleagues, did what they knew to do. But they were thinking, like, this is going to be terrible because all his systems have shut down, his brain damage, she, she's going to have to take him off life support. You know, we're basically what we're doing is putting him on life support now, but he's dead. You know, there's nothing keeping him going except the machine. But three days later, he wakes up, no brain damage, reads his own chart. He's, he's back to work. He's a consultant physician at Kalgoorlie Hospital in Australia. Some of his uh, colleagues were, were Muslims or Hindus. And they all agree this was a miracle. This was mm -hmm. not something that can be medically explained. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to change the subject. I want us to hear that. Yeah. Ahead. No. Well, I, I think, you know, there are going to be some people who say, well, hey, there was a defibrillator involved in this or there was a life support machine. You know, for us, we feel uh, convinced by this because there were other factors at play too, such as, you know, if you go this long without oxygen, you should be brain dead. So you mentioned some details that were miracles in addition to the miracle, if you will, the fact that there was not ongoing damage. And so uh, I, I'm, I am curious, and uh, if, if, this, if you need to hijack this question, no, feel no, free, no. Michael. Uh, but I am curious for the, the skeptical person out there, um, you know, it, on the field in Africa, you know, mm -hmm. somebody who's just prayed over, there's no defibrillator, there's no life support that, you know, do we have anything like that? Oh yeah, okay. oh, yeah we've got lots of those. The, the reason they went for the doctors is because people often say, well, you, do you have a doctor's report? <clears throat> and if you're going to have a doctor involved, there's going to be medical intervention. It's not ethical for yeah. you to not to not use that. So let's say you don't have a doctor involved. Here's a case. This one actually was actually a turning point for, for my thinking. It's not the most dramatic that, that I have, but it was a turning point for my thinking for reasons that you'll soon understand. But uh, I'd heard this story about Antoinette Malambe. So when I was in Congo Brazzaville, I, I interviewed her. And she had, uh, she, she said that when her daughter Therese was two years old. She, she was bitten by a snake. She wasn't breathing. The mother, um, there was no medical help available in the village. So Antoinette Malambe strapped the child to her back, ran to a nearby village where family friend Coco Ngoma Moise was doing ministry. Coco Moise 
prayed for the child. She started breathing again. The next day she was fine. I said, how long was it that she wasn't breathing? And Antoinette Malambe hadn't really seemed to think about that before. So she had to stop and think to get from this village to that village. She calculated it was about three hours. Now, three hours with no oxygen. I mean, six minutes with no oxygen, irreparable brain damage starts in. So this one was kind of dramatic to me, even though it's not the longest period where I have eyewitness evidence. But this one was kind of dramatic to me because Antoinette Malambe was my mother-in-law. Therese is my sister-in-law. She has no brain damage. She has a master's degree. She just recently retired from, from the ministry work she was doing. Wow. Wow. I was, I was thinking of the Gospels where it talks about how uh, those who are raised from the dead, many of them are still with us to this day. Yeah, Quadratus in the early second century says that. Okay. I mean, that, what's the significance of a statement like that? I mean, this is after the Lord has uh, died, after he's been raised from the dead, after he's ascended, and yet we're talking about other people that he raised from the dead that are still with us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Quadratus is writing that in the early second century, and he says, into our own time. So presumably into his lifetime. So by the late, late first century. So you could have people like Jairus's daughter, the widow of Nahum's son. And, you know, some people live a really long time, maybe even Lazarus, but, um, but certainly the children who were raised in somewhere around the year 30 could still be around in the late, late first century. Wow. Okay, so I'm interested in another resurrection story of, uh, of something that maybe happened where there was no medical equipment available to, to intervene. Because you mentioned with that one, you said it's, it's, not the most, it's not the most dramatic story. It was only three hours, but it is still dramatic and personally significant for you. Um, maybe just share maybe, uh, one more resurrection story that stands out to you. Okay, this one's from Sri Lanka. And um, Noel Fernando had a heart attack. He was declared dead in the hospital. They, the, the doctors valiantly were trying to revive him. They broke three of his ribs in the process, but that's, you know, that's acceptable. I mean, if you can save the person's life, if you don't save the person's life, he's not gonna need the ribs anyway. But they didn't have the person who needed to sign the death certificate available. So they, uh, the person was out of the hospital at that time. So they put the body aside for a while. Well, people have been praying for him. And actually, I had this story originally from a couple Westerners who both both knew him. Uh, but uh, later I got it from his, uh, I, I actually was able to uh, get the information directly from his wife, uh, his widow, because he did eventually die, but not of what he died from at that point. He died of something else a few years later. But he was, he was, uh, his body was there over 24 hours. And, uh, but word had gotten around to pray for him, but word hadn't gotten around that he died. And so after 24 hours, he spontaneously came back to life. And there was nothing wrong with it. They were saying he must have brain damage. He had no brain damage. He was interpreting in three languages afterwards. He was the interpreter for two of the Westerners that I knew. He was a pastor. Um, the only thing wrong with him was he had three broken ribs. But um, other people were coming to him. Uh, Hindus and Muslims in the hospital were, were asking questions about what his afterlife experience was to see if it compared with you know their afterlife beliefs. But yeah, he was, yeah. Anyway, that's another account. That one's a bit longer than three hours. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> when well, in the fact that his ribs were still broken so I've, I've shared stories about this where I've seen uh, broken bones and torn tendons get healed. Uh, I remember we had a guy at Wellspring years ago who had torn his groin. And, uh, I mean, that's a significant thing. It was the most awkward. <laughs> he asked me to pray for him. Uh, pray for the—I have him put his hand there, and I put my hand on his arm. Uh, prayed for him to be healed. And then he comes up to me on Sunday at church, he pulls his shorts up and shows me the bruise. And you're talking like a significant one. But then he starts stretching out his legs. He says, There's no pain. I'm completely healed. The, the groin is healed. Uh, why do you think that is? Why did the ribs not get healed just like the bruise stayed? 
as sort of evidence uh, this really happened? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Well, Jacob had his limp, and uh -huh. you, you see sometimes with leprosy being healed in I think Leviticus thirteen and fourteen, where the scar is still there. So God heals enough to do what we need it for, but. He doesn't always seal everything. When it shows there's a greater another, purpose, right? It, a bigger... Yeah, to me it shows credibility because it, it, there would be a temptation to an, exaggerate a story, and, uh, but the fact that you include something like my ribs are still broken shows this is not actually, it, it would at least suggest this is not an exaggeration because while when you had the chance to exaggerate, you didn't. You said my ribs are still broken. Uh -huh. Th there's a story from the... Uh, uh, apostolic faith movement, right from like 19, I think it's 1907, from their um, their magazine that went out just at the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, where they cited the healing of of a uh, uh, Eula Wilson, I think was her name, and it said that she had gone blind, she had all these other things, but that she she died and then she was raised from the dead and completely healed, including her blindness. Well, we. We traced the story back. I had, I had somebody help me on that because this stuff wasn't online yet. It is now. But this person traced it back. The story was from the, the Nazarene messenger. And so it seemed like the story grew in the process because it mentioned all the things that were healed except the healing of the blind eyes. It didn't mention that. It didn't say they weren't healed, but it didn't mention that they were healed. So we thought maybe, maybe it exaggerated that. But then... You know, the Nazarene messenger cited a source, and so my friend went back and checked in the archives of the, the newspaper that, that goes back to like 1906. And in the archives of that newspaper, it, it gives the report of the doctor, I think it was A.O. Burton, <laughs> and he says, uh, yes, and her, her blindness was also healed when she was raised from the dead. Wow. Oh, come on. Yeah. So it wasn't exaggerated. It was yeah. just maybe a logical inference that God did everything. So sometimes he does do everything. And actually, I have accounts of that. Like uh, one, one person, uh, Delia Knox, this is, you know, you've got videos all over the Internet because she was, a, a, she was paralyzed for 22 years and she was singing from her wheelchair. But she was a gospel singer, so a lot of videos. 22 years, I've talked with a lot of people who knew her when she was paralyzed, who would help her, you know, push her wheelchair up the ramp into the, into the van and so on. Um, <clears throat> and one, one time in a, in a meeting where people were praying, she felt healing come back to her legs. She was healed enough that she could actually move her hips into her own power, but her legs were still atrophied. So she had somebody hold her up on either side, but she's moving her legs under her own power and people, Skeptics who would see the video, they'd say, ah, look, you know, you call that walking? That's what they said. A month uh, later, you know, now she's had time. Her, her, her muscles aren't as atrophied. She's been able to work with them. She walks into church and is praying for other people. Wow. And what did the skeptics say on that? They said she must have faked uh, being paralyzed for 22 years. Look, if that's the best you can come up with. That's like a David Hume level right there. I mean, I mean come on. I mean, who's going to do that just so they can claim that healing after 22, for 22 years, suffering that? And then, but on the other hand, there's somebody else that I interviewed, Barbara Comiskey Snyder. She, she had um, severe multiple sclerosis and she had been declining in health for about 15 years. She would spent about half of those in the hospital. She was sent home to die. The doctor said she won't be back here again. She was on uh, a ventilator. She, her diaphragm was paralyzed. She couldn't move her, her lungs uh, by herself. She, in her own words, she was curled up like a pretzel. She was, um, uh, she, she also had gone blind from this. When suddenly she heard a voice saying, my child, rise up and walk. Well, she couldn't move her muscles, but she springs out of bed. First thing she notices is her feet are flat on the ground. Second thing she notices, her hands are not curled up. Third thing she notices, she's seeing these things with her eyes. And she ends up running out of the room and, and waltzing around with her father. Wow. God had healed her to the extent that her, her muscles weren't even atrophied. You say, ah, that's just her report. That is also the report 
of her three physicians, one of, one of whose uh, accounts I've read, and the other two, uh, I've, I've read their accounts and I've also interviewed them. And so, wow. I mean, this, this is, and it wasn't just temporary either. This was 1981. She said no recurrence. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, you want to explain that away? I mean, at least, at least, at least don't say that the miracle accounts in the Gospels have to be made up because eyewitnesses would never claim something like that. Because we sure have eyewitnesses who claim stuff like that today. And often, as in this case, we have the physicians attesting it. Huh. So I, I'm, I'm curious. I've never seen, I, I've seen um, recently, about two months ago, saw a partially blind eye open, uh, mm. completely deaf ear open. Mm. I've never seen blind from birth. Mm. This is somebody who had diabetes, and because of the diabetes, she lost her sight. Um, but yeah, never seen blind from birth. But you have stories like that in your in your book, and I'm kind of curious to know uh, one about the testimony, but then secondly, uh, what that must have been like for that person to suddenly had never seen before, yeah. and now they can, oh, yeah. and the the uh, emotional uh, psychological effect on that person after the fact. Let me give you three stories. Okay. <laughs> if I have time. Yeah. Um, the, the, the first one is a case in, in North India where the man had clouded eyes. So I guess, I don't know if it, well, it seems like they'd be cataracts, but from the rest of the story, it seems like he must've been blind from birth. I, I don't know what it was, but in any case, um, this was a, a friend of mine who prayed for him, and also I consulted some of the other witnesses. Um, he was he was instantly healed of of blindness. He he walked around just looking at, at everything, just in amazement. And that night, uh, he was giving his testimony, and it was at an orphanage, and and all these all these kids were there, and he began to weep. And they said, why are you weeping? He said, because I've always heard the sound of children, but I've never seen their faces. Oh, wow. And, and another case, uh, someone I interviewed from, from Canada. Uh, now, in her case, it, it was not from birth. This, she had uh, diabetes, and that's why she'd gone blind. But, I mean, it was organic. And so uh, she had been blind for 12 years. And there was a, a visiting evangelist who was... Uh, there to pray for the sick and preach. It was a Pentecostal church. And he, he was walking around preaching, and he stopped by where she was. And he, he said to her, uh, well, he, he, he commanded her blindness to leave, and he said, look at me. And, and she tells me that she thought to herself, well, I can turn to you, but I can't look at you because I'm blind. And she looked at him, and she could see him. Wow. And he called her up front and had her, you know, you know how, many, how many fingers am I holding up and so on. And this is all captured on video. This is public information. And her pastor tells me that he still keeps her white cane mm. in his office. Wow. She's still, but she still has so, diabetes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she wasn't healed of everything, but she was healed of that. And, uh, and, and then, real quick, quickly, um, if it's publicly available, is this, do you know, if, is it on YouTube or do you we know? put a link on our, on our um, page for it? I'd have to, I don't, I don't know the link from memory. But um, but I can find. You don't it. memorize it's, hyperlinks, it's, also. It, no. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> He's got everything Bi else. Bible. But. <laughs> I try to do Bible. But, uh, but, um, but we'll we'll look for that and put it in the show notes show notes later. Okay. Yeah, and and then there's another another case where the person was blind for 12 years, where there's an article on it because it's medically documented, and it, and and there there are just other there are other stories. I just mentioned the third one. I could mention some other ones where the experiences that they had. Uh, but I know we're short on time, so. Uh, okay, I'm curious. So when we talk about uh, from birth, I'm curious about deformities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, I've never heard of this, but something like uh, somebody who was Down syndrome or somebody who was a dwarf, uh, uh, something like that, um, or just anything that was a deformity. Do you have some stories about that? <sighs> I, I've heard some recently that I have yet to follow up. Uh, actually, my book was already done by the, 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 the book that's coming out. I can't add anything to it. I did interview. I decided to ask for the most extreme. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, I did. I did interview somebody a while back. Actually, I interviewed three people who knew about it about um, some fingers that grew back uh, while they were praying. Jack has one of those stories too. Yeah. And 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 also I have. Uh, 
I've interviewed people where goiters went away, including um, the the person. He's he's now retired. He's he's working somewhere else. But when uh, Wan Suk Ma was the director for Oxford Center for Mission Studies, <clears throat> I actually told his story at a conference at Oxford, and then just walked down the street afterwards and uh, told Wan Suk and Julie, his wife. They were both witnesses. Uh, that I just used their story, but they had lots of stories of healings. But one of them was a, a um, person in the in the Philippines with a visible, large, toxic goiter, dying, and they prayed, and instantly the goiter disappeared in the sight of many witnesses. So we do have things like that. Like also, disappeared, just vanished, just visibly vanished. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and so there are a number of cases like that. I have other friends who've seen things like that. In terms of an organ regenerating, um, there's also the case of um, Bruce Van Netta, who was Bruce Van Natta, sorry. Uh, he, he was an auto mechanic, and the diesel truck, he was working on the back, the axle broke or, or fell out, and he was crushed, like down to just like maybe one inch on his abdomen. His small intestine was completely messed up. They had progressive surgeries, they eventually had to take most of it out. So he, 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 has, he doesn't have enough small intestine left to be able to digest food. The fact that he survived the whole thing is a miracle. He should have bled to death. But um, a friend of his from New York that led the flight to Wisconsin, Wisconsin where, where Bruce was, and prayed for him. He felt like a jolt in his, in his body and after that, he was able to digest food. And they, you know, I mean, they're not going to, to actually measure, they would have to unroll his small intestine. And this would kind of defeat the purpose of being healed because you'd die from that. But anyway, they, they uh, but his, you know, from what they could tell, his small intestine, small intestines, they can, they can grow wider, but in an adult, they don't grow longer. But it, it grew. It, it more than doubled in length, um, and it grew to sufficient length to to uh, be useful for him. So we we do have accounts of things like that. They're not as common as the healings of blind eyes or raisings from the dead, so far as I know, but we do have accounts of that. We, we've got 10 minutes left on this show, okay. and I, I just want to leave room for any other testimonies that you would want to share, some of the more something that's maybe more marked you or, or personally impacted you? Well, uh, let, let, me, let me give one more that has some, some, medical, some medical documentation. We have, we have 10? I think so. Okay. Is that right? 15. Yeah. Cool. Oh, wow. Cool. Go they cut it. It. More they, story. They cut out the ads. Oh. <laughs> <Sorry>. That's right. <laughs> um, this, this one, um, in Mozambique, Actually, there are a lot of places where revival takes place and, and God is doing these things on the cutting edge of evangelism. That's where you most often see things like this in the Gospels and Acts. I mean, these are the cutting edge of the kingdom breaking the mission forth. going forth. Yeah. yeah. And so um, it's not to say God doesn't do it anywhere else. I mean, Barbara Comiskey Snyder, it wasn't in the cutting edge of mission, so to speak. But um, I mean, she is involved in ministry. She's a pastor's wife and, and so on now. But uh, in, the, in the case of... Uh, Barbara, have you told that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, all I, the I, names. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that okay. was that was earlier. Uh, okay. Which yeah. one? What was she healed from again? She she was uh, she, she was paralyzed. She was in bed. Okay. All her yeah. muscles. She was curled up. And, gotcha. That's and the one. So on. So we have um, in 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 northern Mozambique, there are people that I know who've 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 been there, who've seen this, eyewitnesses. Um, and, and I know the people who are leading this as well. But they, they go to these villages, they preach about Jesus, or they show the Jesus film, and then they say, bring us your deaf. And they, they pray for the deaf people. The deaf people are healed almost always, uh, especially when, you know, it's <laughs> when the people are gathered there. And uh, one, one case that another person told me about, um, they didn't even they didn't even start praying for anybody. They were preaching about Jesus, and suddenly somebody in the back starts screaming. This deaf person had been healed, 
then a blind person is suddenly healed. And then they said, okay, well, let's start praying for people. <laughs> because God was just spontaneously doing it. He wanted to, he's just reaching out to these people, completely unchurched villages, members of another faith tradition, so they can know how much Jesus loves them. And the next day they start a church in the village. Um, so two of the people who, who told me about um, one of these cases, they, they were there in this one village. The, uh, Wendy uh, Dykeman, she's a professor of church history and used to be, I think, the president at United Theological Seminary in Ohio. Um, and also Anderson Park, who's a theology professor there. They were both there and they saw blind eyes opened. And of course, everybody in the village knows these people. So when they see that, they realize, oh, wow, Jesus is alive. This is, this is for real. And the next day, a church was planted in the village. So there was a team that went there and did medical tests as best as you can do in rural Mozambique and came back and they published the study in Southern Medical Journal because sooner or later somebody has to, you know, test this stuff empirically and they published it. This was, uh, I forget, maybe 2010, Southern Medical Journal. Well, the response on the internet was like, people went berserk. Well, testing conditions in rural Mozambique aren't really that good. Okay, that's true. I mean, they did the best they could. Testing conditions in rural Mozambique are not ideal, but one of the authors of the study, Candy Gunther Brown, professor at Indiana University, uh, followed up on this with, with much more detail in her book published by Harvard University Press in 2012 called Testing Prayer. And she has a chapter on that study. And you can tell from that chapter, I mean, people went from being blind to seeing, people went from being deaf to hearing. It's really clear. And anyway, you have to want to explain it away. You have to want to explain it away to not believe it. And of course, a lot of people do want to explain it away. I mean, that's what we're schooled in. I mean, I did. It's I your did plausibility a, structure, it's, right? It's your plausibility structures. I mean, I, I was in a class, my, my, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was one of my, one of my doctoral classes. The professor was a Boltmannian. Uh, for those who don't know, Boltmann was a major mid 20th century New Testament scholar. And he, he had some good ideas and had some bad ideas. And one of his bad ideas was that, oh, well, uh, these miracles can't actually reflect something that actually happened because we know that uh, eyewitnesses would never claim this because nobody in the modern world believes in miracles. And so that's the end of his case. You know, nobody in the modern world believes in miracles. Well, what does that say about his modern world? I mean, he's, he's working from a, a you know. He's anyway, in an echo chamber. He's in an echo, echo chamber. So I, I said, I mean, I think it's like somewhere around 70, 90, 80% of people in the U.S. believe in miracles. And uh, one study, I think like one third of people in the U.S. say that they seen something that they would consider to be miraculous. But anyway, so I, I was doing the class presentation on Boltmann and I, and my professor was a Boltmannian and I said, I think Boltmann's fatal flaw was, he said that nobody in the modern world believes in miracles, therefore these things, we don't even need to take into account that they might have happened. Um, but by saying nobody in the modern world believes in miracles, he excludes all traditional Jews, Christians, Muslims, traditional tribal religionists, two thirds of the doctoral students sitting around this table, uh, basically most of humanity, except for his mid 20th century Western academic elite. And the professor turned red and said, well, uh, Boltmann had his presuppositions, but you have your presuppositions too. I said, that's, that's true. When I was an atheist, I didn't believe miracles could happen. As a Christian, I believe miracles can happen. But let's take a, a so-called agnostic neutral starting point, say maybe they happen, maybe they don't. And then we can look at the critical evidence uh, and evaluate critically rather than just a priori. And then I began to recount cases of instantaneous healing that I had witnessed or experienced and after I'd given a number of these, I said, now, if you want to say 
that these things don't happen, you'll need to discount my credibility as an eyewitness. Whereupon he changed the subject. Um, but when we talk about miracles, cool to see. Th yeah, the, yeah. I wish I could have been. Yeah, there. <laughs> that's a throwdown. I'd have been like, <laughs> get him, Doc Keener. <laughs> well, I mean, he he was he was. He, I think he was polite. I don't think he believed me, but uh, but he also he didn't yeah. think I was lying. He probably thought he probably I was, didn't know what to do with it. Probably thought it was yeah. nuts. Yeah. but whatever. Uh, but. When we talk about miracles, I mean, they're not just, they're not just one-offs in a sense. I mean, they're like historical events. You can't experiment on them. They're not replicable. Like you kill somebody again to see how they died. Uh, but, but they're not one-offs in the sense that there's no context to them. There is a theistic context to them. So in, in John the Baptist, he's in prison. He's waiting for the kingdom. He says... Uh, sends messengers to Jesus saying, are you the one to come or should we look for somebody else? I mean, um, you were supposed to baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. We don't see any fire. Uh, did I get this right? And Jesus sends back to him through the messengers and says, tell John what you've heard and what you've seen. The blind see, the deaf hear, the disabled walk, um, lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and good news is being preached to the poor. So that's his answer, you know, and blessed is the one who doesn't stumble over me. Matthew 11, 5, Luke 7, 22. Well, he's, he's using language from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. These are passages about what in New Testament terms we call the kingdom, the, the restoration of God's people, the good news, our God reigns. Uh, God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. It's, it's restoration language. And what Jesus is showing is these miracles are a foretaste of what's to come. Amen. And, and the same with, the same with uh, Matthew 12, 28 and Luke eleven twenty, 20, where if, if I'm driving out demons by the finger of God or the spirit of God, then God's kingdom has come upon you. So in other words, these are signs of the kingdom. They're a foretaste. It doesn't mean that everybody we pray for I mean, on the cutting edge of evangelism, it happens pretty regularly, but it doesn't mean that everybody we pray for always gets healed, as most of us know from experience. But sometimes God does it, and when God does do it, it's meant to be a gift to all of us, Amen. Whether, whether we have experienced that healing or not, because it's a reminder to all of us that a time is coming when there's going to be no more sickness, there's going to be no more death, He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. And so it's not, it's not the, um, it doesn't do away with all the world's problems. People are still hungry. We still need to work to feed them. People are still sick. We still need to work for health care. Um, in Africa, where lots of people experience miracles because they have to, to survive, um, in many cases, you still have 10 times the, the maternal mortality in childbirth that you have in many developed countries um, in, well, parts of Africa are more developed than others, but you know, where, where my wife is from in Africa, it's very difficult. And so um, Jesus' miracles show us what Jesus cares about. And mm. we need to work for those things, whether by healing or by schools for the blind or, or whatever, you know, for, be, because we should care about the same things he cares yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Okay, so we just we have a, a few more uh, minutes here, and what I'd love to do is is kind of round out our miracles discussion with a, a new category, nature miracles. Okay. okay, so not entirely new. You told the story about the storm. I'd like uh, I'd like to. Uh, are are there stories of, I mean, walking on water, multiplication? Um, Philip is preaching one day and mm -hmm. one day he's somewhere else uh Ezekiel you know he gets lifted up by his hair yeah. <laughs> so well, that one was said to be visionary so we don't oh. know if it was literary, <laughs> I, but... I i am curious couched within that how you understand the first corinthians 12 gift of miracles so mm -hmm. i might even mix in there a little exegetical question i like to i like to throw out like 13 questions in one and just <laughs> let you run and then you give Throw me two, it, two minutes can. to answer exactly all of them. Yeah, exactly yeah. uh well there'll be more in the book miracles today 
coming out, Lord willing, in October of 2021. But yeah, all of those categories we do have eyewitness testimony for. Obviously, we don't have medical documentation for walking on water. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's not a medical thing. Uh, we do have meteor, meteor. Was the water ice? We do. Yeah, right. I actually, I did try walking on the frozen puddle and the ice cracked. Ah. But anyway, um, but we do have meteorological documentation for some of the nature miracles. And actually, they don't all come from from charismatics, by the way. But um, but. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed a couple people from Indonesia, both of whom testified about walking on water. And Indonesia has lots of water, so they really needed it there. It wasn't just to entertain them. It wasn't just to practice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we hear those stories. Like, practice right? on a swimming pool kind of deal. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was in the course of mission, they were doing it. They didn't know that they were walking on water. They assumed the water was shallow until somebody else tried it. And uh, wow. so uh, a couple stories of that in terms of the and there are more stories, but those are just the ones I could interview. And another uh, the, the case of food multiplying, you have that happening in Mozambique. And again, I have friends who've seen that while they were there. Uh, the Anglican Bishop of the Horn of Africa, um, he's from he's from Canada, but he was the Anglican Bishop of the Horn of Africa for a while. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Trinity School for, for Ministry in, I think, Ambridge, Pennsylvania. He, uh, he told me that when they had some refugees come on to uh, where, where he was working there, they, uh, they didn't have enough food to show them proper hospitality. They had enough crackers for maybe a dozen people to each have one. But... All they could do, they prayed over it and started giving it out. They had like 100 refugees there. Everybody ate and everybody wanted to have seconds. So, um, I mean, that's not as dramatic as 5,000, but uh, w we do have a number of cases like that. And what was the other one that you asked about? Oh, and, and a bunch of ones with stilling of storms. One of, my, uh, one of the doctoral students here in, in Old Testament uh, was sitting in on one of my New Testament classes, uh, my historical Jesus course. And he was uh, telling us about a, uh, a storm that he was caught in. He was in a ship, and it was the last ship that was, that was going to this island for a week because the storm, it was, a, I think, a hurricane coming through, and no ships were able to come after this one. Well, the captain's chair broke. The, 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 the wind was coming so hard, but finally... He said, um, the, the captain pointed to somebody in the back who was wearing a Christian T-shirt, said, you, get up here and you pray. And that person came up and, and, and got down on, on, on her knees and prayed. The storm stopped and, and didn't start again until after they were safely at the island. Wow. So um, moral of that, if you uh, wear a t-shirt, be Christian t-shirt, be ready for somebody to call on you to pray. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you have any more questions, Michael? Um, I'm going to have a million questions. I, I could keep going on this conversation okay. for a long time. Uh, so I, I think we'll just, uh, tie it up, maybe make some, uh, some or share some closing thoughts. I'll share first with you, Michael, and then, uh, with you, Craig. And then, uh, what I, the way I'd like to finish the episode, uh, to conclude it would be, um, I'd like for us to pray for people because one thing that I've noticed is that when you share healing stories and miracle stories, faith builds. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so for anybody that's watching that you, uh, you have, uh, some sort of infirmity or handicap, or, you know, somebody who does, we want to, we want to pray for that at the end of the episode. So, mm -hmm. uh, with that said, Michael, I'll defer first to you closing thoughts that you'd like to share. Yeah, I think the probably the more encouraging part was you sharing about how not everybody gets healed. The The point of this is to show that there's coming a day when that will all stop. That to me, I mean, I, I've, I felt a lot of emotion about that. There, there was a, a time where I prayed for somebody in Kuwait who was riddled like you described that young woman and had open sores uh, with mucus just pouring through. It was one of the most gruesome things I'd ever seen in my life. And it, it broke my heart and, and 
the crazy thing is, is I have seen a lot of stuff. I've seen crazy miracles, and yet I saw this this guy suffering horribly and didn't get healed. Mm -hmm. And um, that just it, it again was sort of comforting to know that there's coming a day where that won't be the case anymore. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where even that person that didn't get healed on that day will not have to live in that condition. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think it's just a great reminder. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the whole experience of, of hearing these stories, my, if I, if I came in with like this much faith, I mean, I feel like now I've got yeah. like this, but now give me another hour or two and it'll slowly deplete. <laughs> but, um, but it just really builds our faith to hear these stories. So, so thankful for you to have taken the time to research, to investigate oh, yeah. this. It's so, such a service to the body of Christ. Uh, so, uh, closing thoughts for you, uh, Craig. There have been times when I've been healed. I mean, the only reason I can, yeah, you hear my ankles crack. The only reason that, that my ankles have always cracked, but the only reason that I'm able to run today and jog today is because the Lord healed me after a time when I think, I think my ankle was broken. I was so poor I couldn't go to a doctor, but for two years I couldn't run. And then one day just sparked faith in my heart, healed me. I ran up six flights of stairs to test it out. Mm. But <clears throat> the greatest miracle in my life was actually the day that I was converted from atheism because I became a new creation Amen. in Christ. Amen. And that that's part of that foretaste of the world to mm. come. I um, love it. Being raised up with Christ inside. That's the that's, that's the best. That's the best. <laughs> okay. Hey, I've I remember one thing that we forgot. I want to just come back to this uh, just before we end. So, New Testament gift of miracles, mm. 1 Corinthians 12. How do you interpret it? Well, he mentions gifts of healings. So, gifts of miracles, a gift, gift of miracles must be something that is, maybe it can include healings, but healings don't have to be dramatic. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be It could instant. be a headache or... <laughs> God can use... <laughs> God's still answering prayer if he uses medicine, but miracles tend to be more dramatic. Um, they're demonstrations of power is literally what the what the word means. Okay. So, so like if if you tend to run out of bread, have a guy on your we get out of we run out of bread team. <laughs> like you could just call on like he's gifted in miracles. Like can a single individual possess that, or would you say that like uh, anytime that miracle happens uh, and like, it's not a residential gift per se, would you, would you buy into that? I think it can happen different ways. Um, I, I don't think somebody always, well, I don't think people normally always will have something happen just because they're gifted. They're usually it. gifted in it. But I think Paul is also listing gifts kind of randomly. That's why he has different gift lists with different things in them. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's there's just nine gifts of the Spirit or something like that. I think okay. I think uh, sometimes people want to explain, well, this gift means all of this. And actually, um, Paul didn't stop to explain it. Maybe the Corinthians didn't know what all of these exactly were. He's just illustrating God can do all these different kinds of things. Okay. So prophecy actually, when you look in the Bible, prophecy includes a whole range of things, but you know, he just mentions it as prophecy. So Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's wonderful. So we said that we wanted to to pray for people. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a handicap, if you have a, an infirmity of any kind, or you know somebody does who does, no matter how extreme it is, no matter how many times they've prayed for it, I believe God's built the faith. And even if all you have is a mustard seed and you kind of, maybe you, you don't even have that. You kind of just think that he won't do it, but you have enough faith to pray with us. I want to encourage you to, to just maybe put a hand on that part, whatever it is that you need healed. And, uh, and the, the point of the mustard seed is not how big is your faith. The point of the mustard seed is how big is the God in whom is our faith. Amen. So, uh, so Craig, could you just pray for those with any kind of infirmity to be healed? Yeah. Father, you do things for the glory of the name of your son, Jesus. You have arranged history so that the cross of Christ is the climax of history. And Lord, you paid for the home of the new creation. And so, God, we pray for signs of that new creation now. We 
We pray for samples of that new creation now. We pray that you will honor the name of your son, Jesus, mm -hmm. by, by healing people, people who are watching, people who are listening, people for whom we are praying. Lord, we look to you for miracles, uh, signs and wonders, the things that get people's attention for the kingdom, and also gifts of healings that, whether they're dramatic or not, because we are members of Christ's body, and for our fuller functioning, God, we know that you can do anything. You can, you can make limbs grow out, and you can, you can heal congenital conditions. You can do anything. And whether we consider it big or small, nothing is too big for you. So we ask, not because we're big, not because our faith is big, but we ask because the name of Jesus is big yes, and is worthy to be honored. Yes, so Lord. for the honor of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you will bring healing. Amen. 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 Well, uh, we look forward to hearing you guys share those stories with us. So please send us a message. And uh, if you were blessed by this episode, please consider a donation. You can look for it in the link. Uh, and, and also hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. We're coming out with content just like this all the time. God bless you guys and have a great week.